Well, we've been looking at the encouragement of Paul in Ephesus to be praying on all occasions with all kinds of prayer. Let me say that again. Pray on all occasions. We have different occasions that happen in our life. We have things that we mourn and things that we celebrate. We have things that we uh, are studying and learning and things that we're giving away. We have seasons, all kinds of seasons, and on all occasions in our life, Paul says, be in prayer about those things and be praying with all kinds of prayers, Ephesians 6, 18. So with this in mind, how is it, what does all kinds of prayers look like? What does it mean to pray all kinds of prayers? What other prayers is there? other than, Lord, rescue me, I have a need. We see there's some prayers that we pray really well. And there's some prayers we pray really often. We have prayers like the need prayers, right? The fix it, I call it the fix it prayer. Lord, fix it. I have a need, I have a circumstance, I have a situation, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to change it, I don't know how to fix it. Lord, fix it. And we also have prayers of strength, strengthening prayers or courageous prayers. Lord, give me the strength to face what I'm facing. And so those are some of the prayers that we pray a lot. But Paul says there's all kinds of prayers that we should be praying. And so we're really focusing on kind of five of the main prayers that, man, if we would just add this to our prayer life and pray these more often, it would revolutionize our life with the Lord and his work in us and through us. Um. There was a period of my life in a season where I found myself praying for the Lord to open a door. Lord, open a door. I want you to open that door. I want to walk through that door. I want to experience and do and go to the place that's on the other side of that door. So I'm praying, Lord, make the way. And I was very specific in my prayer. I was, pre I was specific on why I wanted to go through that door. I was specific on what I thought he wanted to do with me on the other side of that door. I was very focused. Lord, open the door. Any of you guys pr ever prayed for something like that in your life? Lord, open that door. And uh, he didn't open it. And uh, I got to admit, I was a little bit frustrated disappointed, wondering, was it me? Was it because I'm not what I'm supposed to be? And I had all kinds of thoughts and I wrestled. And then, you know, some time went by and uh, the Lord revealed to me as clear as day, I'm really glad he didn't open that door. If he had opened that door, I would have found myself in a place experiencing things that could, that would have for sure caused harm and if not, uh, and, and possibly could have caused disrepair in my life. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, even had effects on my family. If he had opened the door, I was so adamant that he opened. It was a very interesting season of my life. And after I kind of, that rev big revelation came to me, Quietly under my breath. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so glad. You definitely know what you're doing. You see, the reality is, is a lot of times we pray for outcomes when we pray. We're outcome driven a lot of times in our prayers. We know the person that we want to get saved. We know when they should get saved. We know where they should get saved, how they should get saved. And we tell the Lord all of it. We know the person, the enemy that needs to be defeated and removed from our lives. We know the punishment they deserve. We know the place that they should go. And we tell the Lord all about it. We know the need we have. We know what it costs and the dollar amount that's required, and we tell the Lord all about it and how to do it. We're outcome driven. But what I really needed in that season where I prayed for the open door was not the outcome. 
what I really needed, and what I now know as I've matured in Christ, what I should have been praying is, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Help me know your will. Help me know your ways and help me come underneath it. I'm not sure if you've ever taken the time to consider how big of a deal the scripture makes about wisdom, but it's literally impossible to read portions of the scripture without wisdom being given, encouraged, promised, set out as a reward for those who will follow him, encouraged for us to seek after, and the scripture even tells us to pray for it and ask God to give us wisdom that we don't have. Wisdom is kind of treated or referred to as a personified character in the Bible. It's almost treated like a person or a spirit in the Bible. A lot of times, uh, in fact, Solomon even referred to in the scriptures as wisdom as a her. Love her. He's talking about wisdom. And, and it's, it's a, 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 something that's given to us to help us increase in our relationship with God and find his will and his way in our life. It is certainly taught to us by scripture to be the, a divine character of God that we can have access to, that we can walk in, that we can bring to bear in the events of our imperfect human life. We can bring to bear the wisdom of God in our lives. Here's the way that the Bible describes wisdom. Let me just give you kind of a short rundown. The scriptures tell us that wisdom is the architect and counselor for God at creation. Wisdom builds a palace and spreads out a feast for those who will receive its instructions. Wisdom gives its students divine spirit to lead them. By the teaching of wisdom, a student The simple will become wise. Rulers will learn how to rule wisely. The confused have discernment. Those who run easy gain understanding and knowledge. Those who respond out of emotion and are rash become free and let the Spirit of God guide them. The ungodly start to know and live in the perfect will of God. Those who understand the value of wisdom, the Bible says, are willing to pay all they have for it. The greatest thing about wisdom, the scripture tells us, is that it will define for us the greatest characteristic and goal of our life, to know God and to walk closely with him and to follow his ways. Because to know the holy God is of immeasurable worth. Wisdom is out of reach for those who mock God. God willingly gives wisdom to those who please him and who have an ear that is turned towards the Lord to hear him. We are to give wisdom our full attention. We are to seek it out, the Bible says. We are to ask for it. We are to grow in it. And we are to pray for more of it. These are all things that the Bible tells us for wisdom. And those who receive wisdom, the Bible says, are happy and find the delight of of the Lord. Now, when I read that list to you, doesn't that somewhere inside of you kind of stir up something like, I'd like to have more of that. I'd like to have more of that. I'd like to partake in the feast that wisdom has spread out for me to partake in. That's an abundance. Feast is an abundance in a place and a time of scarcity. And if that isn't the definition of what's happening in our world today, I don't know what is. I want, I want to know how to do this. You see, this is the key and the starting of us asking for wisdom. Solomon looked at all that God had done and he said, I see God's hand all over my dad's life. I see God's hand all over those stories of miracles. And what I really need is the wisdom from him to know what to do and when to do it. The first point this morning is this. We will only want the wisdom of God if we appreciate what he has done. 
If you don't appreciate what he's done, you're not going to ask for his wisdom. And this is usually the struggle in many of us when we start praying for outcomes is we don't trust the Lord to come up with the outcome we want. So we start prescribing it to him. We don't trust that who he is and what he might come up with. Some of us are missing wisdom in our life because we have failed to recognize or to give him credit for what he has done in our lives and what he is able to do. So instead of letting him teach us, we start prescribing to him outcomes we think is best. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says this. Maybe you've heard this as you've went to church. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You see, when a college student goes to college and he starts to sign up for class, there's these all kinds of options and all kinds of classes. And you know what? Some of those classes may look really interesting. And you say, oh, I really like, I want to take that class. I want that in my life. And you click on it and it opens the page to give the description of the class. And it says, in order to take this class, you need the prerequisite. You know what that means? You can't take this class until you take the class in order. What we talked about last week, exalting God is the prerequisite for wisdom. You can't have wisdom until you know how to exalt him and recognize who he is and what he can do and what he's done for you. It's the prerequisite. That's why we had to start there last, uh, last week. This is what this Hebrew word means. That the fear of the Lord is the beginning. The fear of the Lord is the prerequisite to the wisdom of God. You can't get there until you get here. We must have an awe of his deeds, a reverence for his majesty, a dread for being outside of his will and displeasing him. This is why we have to start with, who is like you, Lord? So that we can say, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do the way you want me to do it. If he is like that, the way Moses described him and the others we covered last week, then I want to know what he thinks about what's going on. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I know because my wisdom is insufficient. I want what he knows because he's the one who's worthy. I want the wisdom of him who is exalted in my life. And what you have to become convinced of to seek and to pray for the wisdom of God is that his way is better. Man, how powerful if we just start out our prayers. Lord, here it is. The mess. Here it is. I know what I think about it. I know what I feel about it. I know what it makes me feel. I know how it makes me struggle, but your way is better. Your way is better. What's your way, Lord? What's your way? You'll never ask for wisdom if you can't appreciate what he's done. Second thing this morning is this. The Spirit of God will give you discernment so you can know God's will above everyone else's. Everyone else's will. Isn't it interesting in life that the older you get, the more people want to speak into your life and tell you what you should do? The, pr- the interaction with Solomon and the Lord goes on, 1 Kings 3, 7 through 9. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child, and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among people. You have chosen a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people. And to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Most evidence points to Solomon being about 20 years old. And he says, I'm only a little child. Lord, I'm too young and immature. And he says, who 
is worthy to govern these. These are your people. So you should govern them. So whatever you say, I'll do. That's the beginning of wisdom right there, is discernment, knowing what to do. The humility he displayed to say to the Lord, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, but you do. The humility. And I just feel like the Lord would just be more refreshed sometimes if he could hear me more often say, Lord, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> have no idea, Lord. You guys all heard the phrase. Maybe you've even spoken it recently. When you found yourself in a situation where you had more responsibility than you had wisdom. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. I find this to be a very odd phrase, but I myself have used it. Fake it till you make it. You know what we're saying? I have no idea what I'm doing. Don't let anybody else know that you don't know how I do what you're doing. <laughs> On the outside, keep it all together and pretend like you know what you're doing. And hopefully, one day you will know what you're doing. The problem is, is we usually only get it to the fake it stage. Because, I don't know, for those of you older than me, I've turned 51 this year, I'm still faking it. Without the wisdom of the, there's still a whole lot of things I don't know how to do. And I don't know what to do in the circumstances that present themselves to, to me in my life. And without the Lord's help and wisdom and guidance, it's still just going to be faking it. And this is the problem is we're kind of saying that with a little bit of hope in our hearts that someday we're going to make it. Only to realize the older you get, the bigger the problems get that you don't know how to handle. Solomon says, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to lead these people. These people are amazing. You chose them. You led them. You gave them their own land. You kicked out all their enemies. You blessed them beyond belief with land flowing with milk and honey. And now I'm in charge? I don't know what I'm doing. You do. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. What a refreshing prayer to the Lord. Because the Lord knows we don't know what to do. The Lord knows that we don't have the answers. He's not expecting you to fake it. He's got all the wisdom you need. He's got all the wisdom. There's a verse that we read all the time in church, Isaiah 55. In fact, I read it last week, so maybe it'll sound familiar. For my thoughts, the Lord says, are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. For as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts better than your ways and your thoughts. And we go, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we hear this verse from the Lord. And I feel like we respond to it or interpret it in a wrong manner. We hear it like there's an adult and we're the little children in the room, right? You remember when you were a little kid and there was adult things happening and we all trying to sneak around the corner and find out what's going on and the adults in the room turn around and go, yeah, not yet, son, go away. The adults are talking. Our ways are higher and better. We're smart and grown-ups, and you're a little kid, so go back out in the yard and just keep playing. I feel like sometimes we hear this verse and we, we kind of think of this verse this way, like God saying, my ways are higher, just step aside, son. You know, that's tragic because that's not what he's communicating. He's saying, my ways are higher. My ways are better because I'm God. It's an invitation to walk in his ways and to walk in and to know his thoughts. 
You see, it's an invitation of don't let your faking it, don't let your pretending, don't let your pride, don't let your, uh, 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 your confidence, overconfidence, get in the way of knowing me and my thoughts and my ways. My ways are higher. Come to me. I'll give them to you. I'll share them with you. Guys, this verse is an invitation for those of us who, who don't know how to do it. For the Lord to show us how to do it. You don't have to live in the brokenness of man's wisdom. Because the God of the universe, whose ways are infinitely higher and better, are more perfect and leads to life, is inviting you to receive his wisdom. All you have to do is ask. Paul tells the church that he pastored in Ephesus. By the way, Paul did three missionary journeys, started tons of church, just planted ministry all around the region. And the time he spent the longest was at this church in Ephesus. And this is what he says he prays for them all the time. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. I keep asking, I keep asking. That means he says it all the time to the Lord. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. The wisdom of God leads us to know him better. Not just better results, but to know God better. Last night, I do what we do when there's nothing on TV and no one else in the room to talk to. I started flipping through my Instagram. And Tina comes in the room and I'm flipping through my Instagram and it goes, do you not know how to deal with stress and want to know what the Bible says about it? Just download this app. It's called the Bible chat app. And they've kind of linked AI to the scriptures and all you have to do is speak to your phone what you're going through in your life and the app will tell you back the biblical wisdom that the Bible wants you to know about how to deal with it. That'd be great if it was all about having answers. It's not about having answers. It's about knowing God. Bible chat is not going to help you know God. It'll just have you know a lot of really good answers to things and you can have all right answers and still be far far away from the one who created you to love you guys it's got to be more than that we cannot reduce our faith down to just having the right answers I had this thing when I was growing up in Sunday school and the Sunday school teacher would try to get us involved, all of us rowdy kids that were always misbehaving. And I, I had this thing in Sunday school that whatever the question was, if I just answered Jesus, I was gonna be right 50% of the time. <laughs> Jesus. Lance, that's not the answer. You can't just say that all the time. 50% of the time though, I was right. You see, it's not about just having answers. We were built for a relationship and knowledge. Wisdom cannot be separated from the relationship connection we have with God. If, you're, if you ask for the spirit of wisdom, you're asking for God to mentor you, which requires showing you his heart. You're asking God to guide you, which requires learning how to hear his voice. You're asking God to teach you, which requires time spent. There is no separation of wisdom in relationship with God. Paul says, I pray that God will give you the spirit of wisdom so you will know him better. And if you know him better, guess what? You're gonna know what to do better in your circumstances. We don't pray for wisdom for results. We pray for wisdom so that we may grow closer to God, have his mind, have his heart in every situation and part of our life. We learn to have his mind and his perspective. We learn to do what he would have us do so that we can bring his kingdom and his truth 
to bear in what we're walking through. Psalms 25, 4 through 5. The prayer of David. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you, O God, are my Savior and my hope is in you all day long. My hope is not in the right answer. My hope is in God. And when I'm close to God, I am confident of this. He is not going to withhold his wisdom from me. He is not going to withhold his understanding from me. If my ear is turned, that's why we're doing 10 days to turn. We are turning towards him. And my heart is receptive. And my goal is to know him more. And I pray, Lord, would you reveal your wisdom to me? Because I don't know what I'm doing. That's a prayer he's anxious to answer. He's anxious to answer. Third this morning is this. The Spirit of God will reveal what is most valuable in a world full of counterfeits. God's response to Solomon is beautiful. I love it. And I believe, I believe with all my heart, it's the same response he'll give to you when you start asking for wisdom. He says, you, Solomon, have found what's most valuable. Listen, listen, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 10. The Lord is pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will be never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be. He goes on to say, as you keep reading, and not only that, I will give you all the things you didn't ask for. And God gave him the wealth and gave him the, he was the only king in Israel to govern in peace, not in war. The wisdom of God is referred to and treated all throughout the scripture as a treasure that is more valuable than everything outside of knowing God. Solomon himself wrote a proverb in Proverbs chapter eight. This is the guy who asked for wisdom and now he wants to teach you and me about wisdom. And he writes a proverb as if wisdom was a person that was talking straight to us in the third person. This is what he says. I'm gonna read you a portion. Proverbs eight, starting verse six. Listen, this is wisdom talking to you. For I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true. My lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies and nothing you desire can compare with her. Wisdom is of great value. You see, it's clear that we live in a world full of counterfeits. Counterfeit wisdom. And when you know the Lord, even though you're still faking some things, but you know the Lord, like he's set you free, he's delivered you, he started to transform your mind and your heart, you start looking in the world and you go, really? That's what we come up with. So the way to be more connected with everyone else in my life is to stare at my screen for hours a day. Really? That's the wisdom we got? What children need to be more fulfilled is less discipline and consequence. We just need to take the reins off and just let them be what they want to be. Really? The way to solve homelessness is let them live wherever we want and just throw tons of money at it. Instead of dealing with the spiritual and emotional brokenness. Churches get to be labeled non-essential while liquor stores are essential. That's our wisdom because people need to cope in hard times. Children have to get parental consent for an Advil at school, but they can change their sex without ever informing their parent. That's our wisdom. That's our wisdom. 
Oh, here, I got a good one for you. The way to protect our democracy is take half the country and make them your enemy. We're going to protect our freedom with that. See, the answer to our broken country is not a politician. The answer to our country is not a policy. The answer to our country is to start admitting what's true. We have no idea what we're doing. God, without you, we are hopeless. You are the answer. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. And without you, Lord, we are going to be lost in despair and brokenness. And everything that is right is going to be made wrong. And everything that is wrong is going to be made right. And we're going to literally destroy ourselves from the inside out without the wisdom, Lord, that you have to give. You see, that's when we start speaking truth. That's when we have the heart to receive and position to receive what God has for us. The list of counterfeit voices and wisdom is everywhere you turn in all facets of life. There, Proverbs 14, 12 makes it super clear. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. That's where our wisdom goes. But when you begin to pray and ask God, hey man, I'm not telling you there's not difficult things. I'm not telling you that when your kid comes home and starts telling you something you never thought you'd hear them say or some pursuit they have in their life you never thought they would pursue that you're gonna know what to do. No, that's when you get on your knees and you say, oh Lord, I will not give in to this. I will not consent to this, but I need the wisdom of God how to deal with this. Give me wisdom. Don't just pray for outcomes because you're going to need to know what to say, when to say it. You're going to need to know when to shut up. You're going to have to need to know when to love and accept and you're going to need to know when it's time to put your foot down and say, not in this house. You're going to need to know when and where, how to act, how to lead, how to love, how to have compassion. And I'm telling you right now, there's not one of us in this room that has the answers to all of that. But if you will surrender yourself to the Lord and stop praying for outcomes and say, Lord, give me the wisdom because without you, we are all in serious trouble. And all of a sudden, when you start to pray for the wisdom of God, God gives you the answer you need. The Spirit starts to work through you and begins to put His fingerprints, not your fingerprints. If it has your fingerprints, it's not going to be good. He starts to put his fingerprints on your home, his fingerprints on your marriage, his fingerprints on your children, his fingerprints on your business and your workplace, his fingerprints on your church, on your community, on your culture, because instead of our fingerprints doing what we think is right while we're faking it, he's given us the wisdom that leads to life. He's given us the wisdom. Ashley, uh, excuse me, Natalie, would you come up here for this minute? I want you to, in fact, just stand. Just stand until we see this last piece. I, just, I have one more thing I want to say to you. I have one more thing I want to say to you. Catch this. Is there a one with a little more light that we can, a setting with a little more light we can put on? Maybe the worship setting or something. I want you to think about this from Scripture. I want you to think about this. Joseph saved his entire people from drought and became the second most influential person in Egypt in the wisdom of the Lord. Moses wouldn't move unless the Lord promised to go with him and give him his wisdom. Joshua defeated an impenetrable city in the wisdom of the Lord because he had his plans. Elijah wiped out an entire leadership of a pagan religion that was destroying the people of God in the wisdom of the Lord. David would not touch the Lord's anointed, even though it was his right to do it in the wisdom of the Lord, and God made him king. 
Hezekiah secured victory for his people and not one arrow flew in the sky because he depended on the wisdom of God. Daniel exposed manipulators of the king and led King Nebuchadnezzar to proclaim that God is the one true God because he leaned on the wisdom of God. Peter went from cutting off ears in the garden to planting the church that still blesses the world and is growing today in the wisdom of God. Paul brought the gospel to the capital city in the most wicked empire that has ever existed in the wisdom of God. We don't need outcomes. God's already got the outcomes. He already knows what needs to happen. He already knows how he's going to orchestrate it if we will turn and give him our ear and say, Lord, not my way. Because, Lord, I'll kill him. But, Lord, you'll show me how. Not my way, Lord, because I'll mess it up and make it so messy there won't be a way back. But, Lord, you got the wisdom I need. If we would just begin to add this to our prayer, the Lord would start to unleash life like we've never seen into our circumstance and into the things that we face. Would you begin to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute? I don't know what you need wisdom for, but you do right now. You already know. You already know because you've already been thinking about it. You've already lost sleep over it. You were probably thinking about it when you were driving to church. You've got a situation with an employee. You've got a situation in your business. You've got a situation in your home. You've got a situation with your child. You've got a situation that you don't know what to do. And without the wisdom of God, you're going to put your will on it and it's going to it's going to mess it up. You already know. In fact, maybe you've already been there. But it's time to say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But I know you do. I'm asking for the wisdom of God. Right now, in this moment, just start asking him. The band's going to play through a song. And as they do, I want you just to have a personal moment with God where you turn your attention from outcomes to seeking the wisdom of the Most High God. Just begin to do that right now. And I will make room for you. 